Sarah had been out with a friend um, and gone to their house, um, the other side of Clapham Common, and left there about nine o'clock that night. Um, and then as she walks the two and a half miles home for 14 minutes, uh, we understand that she's on her, on her phone to her boyfriend. Um, and then once that phone call finishes, she's got headphones and she's just walking home. Uh, towards her house in Tulse Hill. And was this the most direct route for her? Yes, she's got to come across Clapham Common. It would have been dark that night, so perhaps sticking to the roads um, or cutting across the common if she thought it was quicker. Um, and then she gets into uh, the main Cavendish Road, into Poinders Road, uh, which is the most direct route and well lit for her. Yeah, this is an arterial road, isn't it? The South Circular. If I was a single woman walking at night in the dark, I'd probably choose this kind of route that, I think, that might offer some kind of safety. I think you would, and I think even as a man you think it's the most um, safest route to come home. It's well lit uh, with street lighting and plenty of properties around, so yes, I think that's the route that she would have taken in, in every time she went to see her friend. Do you have any idea why she wouldn't have taken a cab home? Well, the investigation identified, as we can hear, that Sarah was very active um, just walking home at night and you've got to think at the time in, on March the 3rd when she went missing there were quite severe Covid restrictions in place in London and not many people were out and about in fact you weren't really supposed to be out and you weren't supposed to be visiting friends either so that was um, something that she just thought maybe getting some fresh air so uh, but no one knows apart from Sarah Yes I mean at that time in lockdown we all were allowed to walk and maybe she saw this as her exercise for the day. I mean, you yeah. don't know that. And I think we were limited on when you could walk and how many times. So, yes, taking that opportunity to walk home, something she's probably done many, many times with, uh, from her friend's house. Um, it's not uncommon to her, and it's, she doesn't feel it's going to be particularly um, a problem for her. How far was she from her home at this point? So when she leaves her friend's house, she's about two and a half miles from her, from her own home. Uh, from here, probably about another mile or so to go outside Poinders Court. When she was approaching this part of the road, what was Wayne Cousins doing? Well, we know before she approached here, the investigation identified that, that she had been seen walking in this direction. Uh, and then what you would do is try and find out how far she's gone after that point. And the investigation team at that time identified that she hadn't gone any further than essentially where we are now. And it, it took uh, a few days for some bus CCTV to come in to, uh, to actually find and see Sarah literally just here with Wayne Cousins and the car that he had hired. Now, until you got that kind of evidence, she had simply vanished? Yes. I mean, it was a missing persons inquiry for a, a couple of days. And because of the nature of uh, uh, Sarah and this, it, the completely out of character for her, the Metropolitan Police's decision to bring in their homicide teams, specialist crime teams and all the uh, um, assets they have with them to, to assist the missing persons inquiry. But it soon became apparent that something had happened completely out of character and there was a real concern for Sarah. So what was Wayne Cousins up to that night? So Wayne Cousins had no reason to be here at all. And I think that was the thing that everybody identified quite quickly. He was a serving police officer at the time hadn't been in the Metropolitan Police very long and he was off duty off duty lives in uh, Kent in Dover had no reason to be here this is probably one of those routes that he would have taken to go to work uh, from out in Dover into central London where he was based so he knew the area he knows the area he knows the roads but had no reason whatsoever and it's clear isn't it that the only reason he was here was to abduct uh, a woman so he was parked up can you just describe what was happening with him and his vehicle? So when he was originally first seen was when he was standing next to Sarah, just further up the road here. The hire car, the white Vauxhall Astra that he hired, was, was uh, parked on the pavement and the hazard lights were, were going. And bus CCTV and some other dash cam footage showed that the doors were open and he was standing with Sarah at that time. And the hazard lights were on? Hazard lights are on. And can you deduce from the footage whether they were talking? Yes, you can see that the two are engaged in conversation, um, standing similar to where we are now in, in conversation uh, next to the car with the doors open. And he's not in uniform? 
Well, it's difficult to see from the footage, and, and um, but the, I think what's clear from the investigation that they identified that he had used his police authority, whether his police badge, uh, whether part uniform, whatever he was doing to effect that stop on Sarah and to make her stop. So what do you know about what happened next? Well, from a witness, I mean, we've heard that now, that a witness uh, saw Sarah being handcuffed. Now, for somebody to get into the back of a car with a, a, essentially a stranger, uh, albeit he might have a police badge, um, without doing anything wrong, it would take someone like Sarah probably not to get into that car. She probably wouldn't have got into the back of that car. The only reason that I can think of, in my experience as a police officer, is that he's had to get her into that car somehow. And the main way to get her into that car is to put her under arrest. And one of the witnesses that has come forward in that inquiry that they found uh, said that they saw Sarah being handcuffed. And um, is there any evidence that she put up a fight, any kind of struggle? N not certainly that they've seen at that point, no. Um, Essentially, Sarah's not the sort of person that if a police officer arrested her, she, she could obviously be completely confused and, and, and quite alarmed and upset, like anybody would, um, but uh, certainly not the type of person that would then fight a police officer to, to get away or anything like that. It's not the type of person she was. From all the inquiries uh, made with their family and friends, the police investigation team identified that she was a strong-willed character um, and you know, it wouldn't have really had that effect on her. She knew what, what was going on that night. Um, unfortunately, she didn't know what, what was going on in that particular incident. What do you think Cousins might have said to her to convince her that she was being rightfully arrested? Well, I don't know. I mean, he could have made up a law. He could have said anything he wanted to to get her into the car. I mean, he could have used COVID as a as a reason to get her into the back of the car and said you're breaching COVID rules and arrested her. You know, Sarah wouldn't necessarily have known every single law and he could have made one up to get her in the back of the car. I mean, that, that has a ring of authenticity about it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And I, I, whatever, whatever it is and whatever he said to her, he's used deceit and deception and, and to get her into the back of that car for the, for the sole reason of, well, abducting her. He was taking a huge chance doing what he did on a brightly lit arterial road with, look, you know, dozens and dozens of homes around us. People, if they weren't out on the streets, were probably looking out of their windows. Why do you think he chose this part? Well, I think then you have to go into what kind of person he is to take that chance. I mean, he hired the, the car that he used to abduct Sarah in his own name, you know, with his own address and his own telephone number. So. Being out in a, in a road like this really you know, it just shows that that's a kind of continuation of the kind of mindset that he is. But he'd made certain preparations. It wasn't as though this was a... You don't think this was a spur-of-the-moment thing for him? I don't think so, and I don't think anybody who worked on that investigation and, and will think that this was nothing other than pre-planned, premeditated. This is part of him, what he wanted to do. He's hired a car, he's, gone, he's, he's driven... 70 odd miles to come into central London to abduct somebody, whether his intention was then to rape them and kill them. Um, he's admitted to that. He's admitted to all the facts that the police and the CPS have put in front of the court that he abducted, raped, and murdered Sarah. So I think that's what he set out to do that night, chilling as it is. Um, what do you think happened, or what do you know happened next? Well, once Sarah's in the car, there's obviously that gap of what's being said or what actually happened. In terms of the route he's driven out of London, uh, the, the police investigation has used AMPR cameras, CCTV, his own telephone with his cell site um, information that's held on it to put him all the way back into Dover. Obviously, Sarah What's happened to Sarah in between London and Dover doesn't really bear thinking about. I mean, he told a bizarre story when you arrested him, or just before you arrested him. Yeah, when officers went into his house, he's, he's come up with this really elaborate story that he was involved with some European sex traffickers or a prostitution gang, and they, uh, that he had done something wrong and needed to replace a girl 
and that's the reason why he was getting somebody off the street to give to this gang. Uh, that's and that's the thing he said when the officers were in standing next to him in his house. I mean, it sounds crazy, but you couldn't ignore that, could you? Police investigations can't ignore things like that. You know, we've we've all been involved in the most bizarre of, uh, bizarre of investigations where you think the story is not true, but it turns out to be true. So you have to an investigation team that that, that dealt with this investigation would have gone meticulously through CCTV footage from here to Dover to see if that car stopped, if he was met by anybody else, whether he was with anybody else. And obviously they found that nobody else was involved in this at all. It was just him, his idea that what he wanted to do when he left his Dover house to come here to abduct somebody. Um, and Sarah was unfortunately his target that night. How quickly did you identify Cousins? Well, the, the investigation was waiting for um, CCTV footage. We didn't know if it would hold anything. But when buses move up and down roads, they have cameras at the front. So you wait for that footage to be down. It's not a quick thing. So in between that time, you try and identify uh, any other CCTV cameras that might help. You would look at um, people that uh, were seen on those cameras to see where they went. Um, but obviously, the investigation team didn't see Sarah past this point. So there is something has happened uh, here. And it could have been that she turned off and gone down a back alley or something like that. But that's that again, that was, you know, ruled out quite quickly. So it was the point that the CCTV camera from the bus identifies the car. And then with other CCTV, you can see the number plate. The number plate comes back to this car, a higher car from Dover. Immediate inquiries into there, as you can imagine, as fast as possible, identify that Wayne Cousins has hired that car. And then the next stage is who is Wayne Cousins himself. And, and then, you quickly found the answer. Yeah, and it was, you know, it's one of those things, and I, I, and I know in the SIO and all that team and everybody that worked on it and all the different um, people that came together when they found out that it was a police officer, um, it was something that would stay with me, certainly, before I left the Met, that would stay with me for the rest of my life. And I think it upset a lot of officers, um, as you can imagine. And, um, and it's terrible publicity, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the perception of the public that a police officer could be responsible for this, you know, this authority figure. I mean, you tell me in your words that how the public yeah. generally view cops. I think, do you know what heartbreaking is what it was to start with? To start with because, you know, the, the policing is, is, is not an easy job, as we all know. And, and, you know, we get bashed up a lot by the media. Um, and I think that when those officers realised that it was a police officer. You, you know, some of those things that you, you, you have in common practice in your, in your family lives come into play. When you tell your children, or you tell a, a friend or whatever, you know, if you're in trouble, try and find a police officer. Well, that, what he did that day has set that back uh, to, to such a, a distance behind us that we've, you know, you try and recover and you try and say we're not like that. You know, there are thousands of police officers working in this country who sent in messages of support to say to the family we're not like that that's not what we are about and you know that was a really that's a really important message i think to say that yes it's difficult to understand police officers you know and i've i've now recently retired but police officers do not view wayne cousins as a police officer they view him as a murderer who happened to be a police officer rather than the other way around a police officer who is a murderer and it's a really important thing you know he doesn't hold the same values as a police officer. He doesn't have the same personality that we do. You know, he's a very sick, a very dangerous individual who should never have been near a uniform. Can you tell me a bit about having identified him? There was still an awful lot of work to do, wasn't there? Because he wasn't initially admitting anything. Yes, I mean, he did say those few things about the European, East European scenario. Yeah, and okay, then but... moving on from that, when he's interviewed by uh, the investigation team, he doesn't say anything, he just says no comment. And he's never offered an explanation from that point to now. Even at conviction, never, even at sentencing, has never said anything about it. So there are still lots of unanswered questions about what happened. Where was Sarah murdered is one of those questions. It would be, it would be such a thing that the family would want to hear to know the full story about what happened. And there will be some, obviously, horrendous details in it, but 
there's, such, there's so many elements of this case which the police still don't know. You know, where did it happen? What did he exactly do? But we do know then that he's taken Sarah and probably killed her between then and returning the hire car at 8.30 the next morning into Dover. He's had to transfer her body into his own car at some stage as well, because then he takes his own car to Hodes Woods in Ashford in Kent, where he takes her body and probably keeps it under what we believe was a fridge freezer at the time and is then going on to buy rubble sacks in shops, order things on the internet. And leaving a trail. Leaving a trail all the time, anyone. using his own credit cards or, or you know, his own finance to, uh, to do that, using his own accounts to buy things on the internet. And then, really sadly, obviously, he finishes by setting fire to uh, the body of Sarah. And um, then he would transfer that into sacks, into, um, uh, a big rubble, uh, big builder's sack, and then she was deposited in a, um, a kind of water area within Hose Woods. Um, I know that you can't answer precisely this, but can you put yourself in Sarah's position? She's been arrested, she's in the back of the police car, she's handcuffed, and at, presumably, because there's no evidence of a fight, um, initially she may be thinking, well, OK, perhaps there is a legitimate reason, perhaps I shouldn't have been out, but as the car travelled through South London, what do you think might have been going through her mind? Well, I think this is something that a lot of people have talked about. You know, at what stage would Sarah have realised something was wrong? He, he might have asked her to turn her phone off. Um, it, it could have done something like that, you know, which would have been normal police practice, you know, turn your phone off or give it to me, you can't have it as a, as a prisoner at the time. Um, and then he has gone to, driven out of London. And I think at that point, Sarah must have been thinking, what's going on here? You know, quite often in, in policing, cells in London became full up, become full up. So you're not necessarily, you might not necessarily go to the closest police station so where you have, are arrested. They may have passed a police station and he might have said, look, we're going to go to the next one. Yeah, or, or I work at this one, or this is where we deal with this type of prisoner. He could have said anything so that to stop her from um, panicking or, or, or realising that something was wrong. But I think it's got to be, it's got to be at some stage when she's realised, well, wait a minute, where are we going? You know, he's heading towards Dover. So there's got to be something happening between London and Dover where... And her he's, feeling he's, completely powerless. Yes, I mean, being handcuffed, obviously, as we know, is, you know, it, it is restrictive for a reason, right? And so I think, it doesn't really bear thinking about that she's, you know, she, she's powerless to know what's happens next. Um, and it's, it's really sad to think that she's that, that quite scary situation that she's in at that point. This case does throw up and puts a focus on the vetting of police officers. It's not as simple as the public might think, is it? No, I mean, officers have to go through different levels of vetting depending on what they become involved in within policing. The first vetting is to become a police officer in the first place. And then you might go into other different departments where the, the vetting is higher. But there isn't a huge department of people doing this. You know, when you are talking potentially about things like 20,000 officers joining policing, you know, 6,000 of those are directed towards the Met Police. Which is what we're going through now, which the recruitment. Going, yes, the recruitment. So when you, when you bring in uh, vast levels of recruitment, and quickly as well, then you have to have a system behind that which supports that level of vetting. So perhaps in some cases it's not as watertight as it should be. And Cousins wasn't somebody with any criminal convictions. I mean, there may have been suspicions about him, but, you know, obviously if somebody's got criminal convictions, that's one thing. But having, you know, maybe odd behaviour, it's very difficult to use that to preclude somebody from doing what, you know, for most cops is a pretty grim job. Yes, I know his level of vetting would have been high as well because of his use of a firearm. He's come from another form of policing, not the standard policing that you think a police officer goes through. He's not walked the streets of London and worn a uniform and, and talked to members of the public and run after criminals or dealt with prisoners in custody. He's not done that sort of thing. You know, and so, so he's come into this, this kind of policing that he was doing and he's carrying a gun. So his level of vetting would have been quite high and it would have been done properly. 
If you talk to his uh, friends, you know, the, the investigation talked to colleagues and friends, as you can imagine, nobody saw this. And that's a really important point. Nobody saw this. Nobody would raise the red flag. Nobody at work read, re, uh, raised the red flag for him. You know, yes, he was off sick with stress, but that was quite, you know, in the few days that he, that he had told his supervisors. But he's not, he's not somebody that would stand out as, a, as an oddball or something you would think, right, we need to, we need to stop what you're doing. And, you know, so there's, there's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between vetting 20,000 people and that sort of thing and getting that right all the time. And mistakes aren't necessarily mistakes. They're just things that you can't see. And I didn't ask you about his phone. He, tell me what happened with his phone. Yeah. So at the time that officers went through Wayne Cousins' front door to arrest him, what had been discovered later on was that Wayne Cousins had wiped his phone clean minutes before he was arrested. And but did it do him any good? Well, potentially he might have got rid of some stuff that we would never see. But what is, does remain is your cell site, which is your telephone and call data. So that was able to, we were able to use that at, at the time to track him in London and out to Kent and then all of his movements around the wood where uh, he eventually deposited Sarah's body.